section and if we have any additional input or comment we can ask uh, we can ask uh, angela but thank you she, she did say she's available to answer any question we have. yeah because she also worked with conservation ontario mm -hmm. and she also worked uh, partnership with uh, rido and mississippi so they all kind of work together which is collectively which is very good you know anyway i figured i'll let you know Good morning, everyone. Just to let you know, the stream is live now. Okay, thank you, Melody. Thanks, Mel. Thanks, Mel. Mark, it's okay, we can ask you that question. Uh, item number two, the draft budget. Should we go to this item first and keep the conservation second? Because uh, we have a lot of staff from, uh, from finance on the call. And I don't expect to be uh, a long item. Uh, draft budget for Iraq is usually small. Entirely up to you, Chair. No, because the other one, I'd like to take a little bit more time because most of councillors on, on that committee, they are on conservation authority and they might have a little bit more questions about it than the other sure. one. Sure, yep. Would that be okay, George? Yes, Mr. Chair. And um, Chair, you know that uh, Councillor Gower and Councillor uh, Meehan will both be late. Yeah, okay. Yes, I, I uh, yeah, we get the message from Councillor Meehan last night uh, and Councillor Gower told us it's gonna be about half an hour late, so. Uh, right. But we do have corn with the-, the Scott, the as long as Scott comes in there, we should be okay. Okay. <laughs> Hey Richard, how are you? Testing one, two, this is just for YouTube. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three.
morning, Councillor Kitts. Good morning, how are you? Not too bad, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Good. Good morning, Councillor Kitts. Good morning, Councillor Elshantiri. How are you? Good, thank Chair you. Chair Elshantiri. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I'm still uh, still brushing up on all my legislative uh, oh, that's, that's procedures. <laughs> So, Mark, we need uh, we need Councillor Moffitt to uh, to have corn. Is that correct? You're on mute. Yeah, and he's going to end up doing the budget uh, motion if Councillor Gower is not back yet, too. So, okay. Councillor Moffat's with us now, Chair, so. Good morning, everyone. I see Councillor Murphy join us, and uh, I believe Councillor Gower and Councillor Meehan will join us shortly. Both indicate they are busy for the first half an hour. So, folks, this uh, particular meeting will be hosted in Zoom, particularly by joining the meeting by calling toll free telephone number using Zoom. So, for my colleague, I don't have to tell them we've been on Zoom for a long time now. If you need to uh, speak, you can use the hand. Uh, in the participant or you can just wave at me. So we are a small group. We can, hopefully you can see everyone on the screen. Uh, uh, first of all, welcome to uh, our meeting for December uh, 3rd, 
2020. There's a statement I'd like to read. So uh, this is a public meeting to consider the proposed comprehensive official plan and zone and bylaw amendment listed as item three on today's agenda. For the items just mentioned, only those who make oral submissions today or written submissions before the amendment are adopted may appeal the matter to the local planning appeal tribunal. In addition, the applicant may appeal the matter to the local planning appeal tribunal if council does not adopt the amendment within 90 days of, of, the, of the applications for zoning and 120 days for, an effort for the official plan amendment. To submit written comment on these amendments prior to their consideration by the city council on November 25th, please email or call the committee or council coordinator. So uh, uh, we like to call on uh, Mr. Desjardins. Do we need to uh, do we need to uh, call for uh, call roll, roll call? Roll call, please. Okay. Councillor Kitts. Here. Councillor Derouze. Here. Councillor Moffat. Here. And Councillor Meehan will be late. Uh, Councillor Gower as well. And Chair El Shantiri. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dishan. Yeah, for him. Thank you, sir. Uh, again, uh, declaration of interest. See none. Confirmation of minute. Minute 18, meeting of uh, 5th November 2020 of the Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, item number one, uh, we have an update uh, change on the conservation authority. And uh, I would, with the, with the will of the committee, I would like to do item two, which is the draft operating and capital budget for agriculture rural affair committee before we do item number one. So this way we can release our staff from finance. As you all know, uh, Iraq budget is small because most of our items are listed with the transportation committee. So uh, with, with the wish of the committee, we can go to item two before we go item one. I see thumbs up from my colleague. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, so I will hold item one and we'll hold item two. Uh, item three is a zoning bylaw amendment 2415 Richard Side Road in uh, Richard Side Road in uh, West Carton Mars. Item one, that the Agricultural Affairs Committee recommend council approve an amendment to zoning bylaw 2008-250 for 2415 Richardson Side Road for the purpose of rezoning the land from rural countryside zone RU to rural countryside zone rural exception and to add a warehouse as permitted use as a detail in document two, and item number two, that the Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee approve the consultation detail section of this report be included as a part of previous explanation. Uh, to my knowledge, there's only one speaker, and I think the speaker in support of this application, Mark, is that correct? correct. And uh, and this item, as you folks, I think. Uh, who know the area they would know is no one in our community as the CBC building. And I have to tell you, it was a real pleasure dealing with these folks and, and what they're doing and their professionalism and their application. So uh, we have no speaker against this item if with the will of the committee and uh, and if it's okay with the, with the individual who's on the call to carry this item. Can we carry this item? Carried. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, I didn't get the name, uh, Mark, of the gentleman speaking on this item, so we can thank him. It's uh, Mark Rive, and he is on uh, from JL Richards. Uh, Mark, you're okay. We carried this item, correct? Correct. Oops. Thank you very much, Mark, for joining us today. Thank you. Have a good day. Uh, item number four is a new zone and bylaw proposed work plan. And uh, that's the Agriculture Rural Affairs Committee recommend council approve 
One, the work plan for a new comprehensive zoning bylaw replacing bylaw 2008-250 with the final draft of the new zoning bylaw to be before council for consideration for Q4 2024. Two, that a major changes, big moves and quick hits report be submitted following adoption of the new official plan in Q4 2021. That will outline staff finding and recommendations on the form and structure of proposed new comprehensive zoning bylaw. B, describe the general nature and scope of changes to the zoning regime that will need incorporated onto the new zoning bylaw to meet the needs of the council approved growth management plan and a new official uh, plan policy direction. C, lay out the course of work and budget requirements for subsequent uh, phases of the new comprehensive zoning by law project, including any necessary amendment to the work plan. D, identify any opportunities for amendment to zoning by law 2008-250 quick hits that may particularly be undertaken in the immediate or short term to better implement criti critical official plan direction while the full comprehensive zoning by law has been developed including amendment to respond to a development pressure or major policy initiative, such as zoning uh, and three, establishment of a council sponsored group to support and advocate for the new zoning bylaw project as described in this report. Four, that the joint committee of planning committee and agriculture and rural affairs committee be delegated the authority to hold any statutory public meeting required for consideration leading to the enhancement of the comprehensive zone and bylaw. So we have staff, uh, Dave Weiss and Carol Reddy and Andrea, and I believe Steve Willis said was gonna join us. Uh, I'm not sure if my colleague have any question on this, we need to hold it. I just read it just because uh, for the people on our YouTube. Is any questions, should we hold this item? Just one, just one quick question I have. Go ahead. Uh, some so in terms of obviously pertinence to this term of council, I know this stems a lot from our, our previous OP uh, discussions and the need to move quickly with the comprehensive zoning bylaw uh, to ensure that we can implement our growth projections and our certainly our intensification uh, targets. So just for, for the terms of this, um, report on the, on the, the quick hits part. That's really going to pertain mostly to things outside of the purview of, of agricultural affairs committee, correct? It would generally be some tools to ensure that we can get to that 60% intensification target uh, that we've set. Um, so mostly within the urban area, what is what I would assume on the, on the big moves and quick hits aspect. Mr. Chair, uh, the, the likelihood is that yes, it will be prom prom <laughs> predominantly focused on uh, on the implementing the growth management strategy and anything that we need to do in the short term in order to achieve those goals. Uh, we may be considering uh, some uh, smaller, more housekeeping updates uh, that might be necessary to uh, to really clear the decks uh, as we go forward to the to this uh, very significant project. Uh, so we might be making some changes to the rural area uh, and to some of the villages and whatnot as we go forward. But those would be uh, less substantive at this time. Those would be uh, those would be more again along the lines of making sure that we are getting things ready for the big work to come uh, later in the uh, in the course of the project. So the final report projected, you know, out six years from now, really is the report that would more likely have an impact on, on rural Ottawa than that initial Q4 2021 report, correct? Well, the, the planned report, uh, the planned bylaw will be accomplished within three years after the passage of the official plan. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to get it done uh, sooner than six. Uh, we're looking for a little bit of a faster time frame than that. Um, yeah, but yes, that. that's, that. that's, that's when you would see the more uh, substantive meat uh, that might apply to, uh, to ARAC at this time. Okay, thanks. I'm not sure why I saw this. I thought I saw the 60 or so somewhere in the report. I thought I saw 2026 written somewhere in the report. Anyways, that's good. No, thanks, for, thanks, David. And uh, Mr. Weiss, since you're still on the call, so basically also that clean up some of the small items of 
left behind in uh, zoning by law, if, if I understand correctly, because as we went through it not too long ago in North Gore, they changed the zone. But uh, anyway, so basically this is to tie it up before the official plan or to go hand in hand with the official plan. Is that correct? That, that's correct, Mr. Chair. Uh, there's a number of, um, of exceptions uh, that still need to be uh, dealt with. There are some boundary changes. There's a number of other items that are relating back to uh, OPA 115-180 that still need to be resolved. Uh, and we're still going to keep moving forward with those pieces uh, so we can make sure that there's, again, as clean a slate as possible uh, before we move forward. And will, will you be looking at that? At that, I mean, Councilor Shantiri rightly brought up the, the North Gore example where the North Gore's secondary plan was not aligned with the zoning and never, unfortunately, was implemented into zoning. Uh, would we make sure that we're looking at those types of situations, even though they aren't predominantly part of this OP, but their previous OP decisions that were then just missed on the zoning bylaw? Um, uh, just yes. move it over to Carol. Yep. Chair, um, Councilor um, yes, we will be looking at um, pressing issues and villages that need to be looked after, certainly they're not, we're not going to let those sit during the time that we're working on the comprehensive zoning bylaw. Good. Yeah. So there's certainly a, a, a commitment to do that for sure. Yeah, that was certainly that was certainly the crux of the issue in North Core, unfortunately, was just that alignment of policy to zoning. Yes. So thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, if there's no uh, other question from my colleague on this item, can we carry this item? Okay. Hey. Uh, I see Councillor uh, Meehan made it earlier than she thought. Uh, welcome, Councillor. Uh, item number five, amendment to the permanent sign on private property bylaw 2016-326. Uh, the item is that the Agricultural Rural Affairs Committee <coughs> recommend Council, one, approve amendment to the permanent signs on private property bylaw 2016-326 as detailed in document one, and two, delegate authorities to the chief building official and legal services to finalize and make minor changes to the form of the amendment to the bylaw in document one to give effect to the intent of council. So folks, this item in front of us, A, to review uh, the, the bylaw on a private file, but also if you remember uh, a few months ago, I brought the temporary uh, temporary exemption for uh, signage on, in a rural area. And then we thought maybe it's time to revisit the signage uh, bylaw on a private property. We have on the call with us Richard uh, Ash this morning. If any of my colleagues have any question, uh, any question about uh, this uh, permanent sign bylaw or should, can we uh, carry this item? Uh, just a comment, Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead, Council. I just want to thank you and thank staff. I know that you, uh, every once in a while, we bring amendment and we bring uh, temporary amendment and we drag in rural areas, specifically our resident, and we're always arguing over signs. So I'm glad that you addressed this issue and you brought this bylaw to address all these little gaps. So thank you and thank staff for the work that they've done on that file. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, thank you Councillor Uh Richard, did we miss anything? Richard Ash on the call. Did we miss anything uh, from? No, no, I think you've covered it, Chair. And and this we're hoping uh, the changes will uh, will serve the need for the rural area when we have signage in, in a major road collector like 80 kilometer, whether in any area, the size of the the sign will be uh, be able to be bigger now. If to, to put in that perspective. Correct, yeah, much, much bigger. I mean, there was there was an anomaly there on the uh, to recognize the rural environment and we've corrected that. Uh, and I think that we've balanced everything out there. So uh, yeah, there's much larger signage permitted, but still, but still understanding the character of the rural environment. Well, I really appreciate it. I appreciate staff is work on this and uh, I wanna thank you Richard for joining us this morning. And I don't see uh, any objection with to carry this item. So with this item K. Okay. Thank, thank you, thank you, Richard. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you. So now we go to item uh, two, the, the draft operating and capital budget uh, for Agricultural Rural Affairs Committee. This way we can have this item presentation, and then we'll go to item one, which is I presume is going to take uh, more time. So uh, sure. that will leave it to. Uh, Okay, sorry, Mark, did I miss something? 
there is the extra item too. I don't know if you just want to wait till the end on that or. Yeah, I thought we'd wait to the end for the for the other stuff. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Mr. James, you're going to do the uh, the draft operating capital budget for Agricultural Affairs Committee, I believe. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair uh, Elshintiri and uh, members of uh, the Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee. Uh, my name is Doug James, and I am the uh, Acting Director uh, of Planning Services. And I'm here today, I'm pleased to be here today to actually help uh, deliver uh, the 2021 Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee budget. Um, also presenting with me today, and actually probably doing mo most of the talking, uh, will be uh, Jen Nielsen, uh, who is the Acting Manager of Asset Management. Um, also on the call uh, today, we have um, Karina Dukos uh, from Infrastructure Services. Uh, we have Don Herweyer and Geraldine Wildman from Economic Development and Long Range Planning. Uh, I see um, we have uh, Wendy Stephenson, uh, from, uh, the, who is the uh, City Treasurer, uh, who's here on behalf of finance. And if there's any questions, I guess, with respect to the numbers, she's probably the best person to talk to. Uh, we should have Luke Gagné from Public Works, uh, Dan Chenye from Recreation, uh, Cultural and Facility Services. Uh, Adam Brown is here as well, uh, who's the manager of the uh, Rural Branch here in Development Review. And I believe we also have uh, Steve Willis on the line. All here, as I mentioned, will be uh, happy to answer any questions uh, that do come up. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next slide before us here is uh, the agenda. Um, uh, this morning, as of course, we'll be, we will be reviewing the Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee operating and capital budgets. Uh, and as mentioned here on this slide, the, there's an overview presentation, which we are doing now. Uh, we have uh, public delegations, uh, questions to staff. Uh, we also have a review of the budgets and uh, the budget recommendation to council uh, which of course the budget has been tabled and will be discussed uh, and debated by council uh, next week. Next slide, please. Uh, this next slide uh, shows us the operating uh, budget summary. Um, the, um, the budget areas uh, there are include uh, uh, development services there in the two, uh, the two rows on starting from the left, development review services in the rural. Uh, also, we have the rural affairs office. Um, the development review uh, rural proposed 2021 budget, uh, you can see there is approximately, and those are in millions of dollars, uh, 1.91930 million dollars. Uh, the Rural Affairs Office, uh, the budget proposed uh, for next year uh, is approximately $1,127,000. And when you add those two together, you get the total budget, which is $3,057,000. Next slide, please. Um, the budget includes uh, an adjustment, of, um, things that you'll see within the budget, includes an adjustment for potential uh, cost of living increases, uh, as well as in increments and uh, benefit adjustments. Um, so those are part of the things that will be discussed today. But um, the next slide, please. And I would like, uh, with the next slide, uh, we're going to talk about the capital budget. So I'd like to turn it over uh, to Jen, who will speak uh, about the next uh, the issue within the capital, uh, within, the, uh, within the overall budget. Jen? Right. Good morning. So the proposed 2021 capital budget for renewal of city assets is approximately $2.35 million. Next slide, please. In order to accomplish the initiatives identified in the capital budget, the draft 2021 budget would draw $2.35 million from the capital reserve fund. Next slide, please. So the City of Ottawa maintains nearly $50 billion in existing infrastructure assets. All of, the, all of Ottawa's infrastructure assets are safe. We apply a risk-based approach and to ensure that priority is given to critical infrastructure. Roads, especially in the rural area, remain a high priority for Ottawa residents. The City is committed to maintaining roads based on industry standards. To manage the extensive road network, we apply a recognized industry best practices and we're always looking for ways to improve how roads are built and renewed. Although much of this funding falls under the purview of other committees, draft budget 2021 invests approximately $41.6 million to upgrade rural infrastructure, including approximately 9.4 million to replace and repair rural culverts, an additional 9.4 million for bridge structures, approximately 3.7 million for buildings and parks, including accessibility, 
and approximately 16.7 million for resurfacing, road preservation, and sidewalk renewal. Next slide, please. So here are some highlights of the rural road upgrades, which are planned for 2021. So we have approximately $2 million to upgrade and install new guide rails. We also have $400,000 to upgrade rural roads, including $360,000 to upgrade Granger Park Road near Upper Dwyer Hill Road, and $40,000 to upgrade the gravel road on Alfalfa Street um, near Boyd Road. From a resurfacing perspective, we're investing approximately $16.7 million to resurface roads specifically in the rural areas. Here are some highlights of some of the roads that we'll be doing this year. So we have Bank Street between Snake Island Road, Victoria Street, and Mitch Owens Road. River Road between Flag Station and Mitch Owens. Thomas A. Dolan Parkway between Dunrobin and Sixth Line Roads. Bankfield Road between 380 meters east of First Line Road and Rideau Valley Drive. Colonial Road between Monseigneur Denis Court to Canaan Road. Next slide, please. We also have a number of structures that are being done in the rural areas and they're either being designed or constructed within our budget envelopes. So we have approximately 9.4 million to rehabilitate uh, structures, so bridges or bridge culverts. Um, some highlights include the Second Line Road Bridge uh, construction, construction of Dalmac Road Bridge, construction of the Quinell Bridge on Russell Road over Beaver, Bear Brook Creek, construction of Milton Road Bridge over Bear Brook Creek, and designing the Fluellen Road Bridge. And lastly, under the purview of the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Wastewater Management Committee, $500,000 um, of municipal drainage works was identified. So it's for anticipated capital works under the Provincial Drainage Act. These are legislative requirements, um, including petitions for drainage improvements, changes that come through the year, and it is a largely cost recoverable item. And with that, we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jen and uh, James, for your presentation. Uh, I'm going to check the, the hand. I don't see uh, any question from my colleagues to, uh, to staff about the budget. Jen, perhaps uh, you mentioned some of our budget uh, is uh, with other budgets of the city. Uh, should we should we point that out that like how much of our budget will be part of the transportation budget as well? Yes, so I can certainly do that. So under TRC, so the transportation committee, we have the resurfacing preservation and sidewalk renewal for sixteen point seven million dollars, and we also have the transportation structures, which is nine point four million dollars. Um, buildings and parks is spread over multiple committees because it depends on what the use of the facility is. And the total there is $3.7 million. And uh, lastly, structures rate, so the culverts design and construction, I believe falls under the Standing Committee for Environmental Protection um, that uh, Chair Moffat leads. And that's in the order of $9.4 million. So the total across the other committees is $39.2 million. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Uh, uh, to my knowledge, uh, Mr. Desjardins, we don't have uh, public uh, speaking on the budget. Is that correct? That's correct. Oh, there are no delegations. So. No delegation. So we'll go to uh, Councillor Moffitt, who's going to uh, read the, uh, the budget motion for us. Councillor Moffitt, do you have the motion or do you need to put on the screen or... Come up on the screen. So it's that the uh, Coastal Affairs Committee recommend <clears throat> that council sitting as Committee of the Whole approve the Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee 2021 draft operating budget and capital budget as follows. So I'm not sure if you now want to go through one, two, three, or I'll read them and then you just ask for carried. Okay, so uh, on the, uh, I, on the uh, motion, okay. So, no, so, okay, so. Oh, we've got to go one, but so, yes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll read one and then you ask. So one, okay. development review process, rural operating resource requirement, page two. Okay. Okay. Two, rural affairs office as follows. Uh, one, 
user fees, page five, to operating resource requirement, page four. Okay. And on three, that the Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee capital program, page six, individual projects listed, pages 13 to 15. Okay. Sure. Perfect. And the item itself, item number two, operate, uh, sorry. Uh, the, the draft budget operating capital budget agricultural affairs committee is the item K. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Moffat. And uh, uh, we'll go to item number one. And item number one is uh, update and uh, proposed changes to the Conservation Authorities Act contained in Bill uh, 229, project support and uh, recover from COVID-19 Act. As you folks uh, know, most of us around this table, I think, and, and this meeting are involved in uh, our local conservation authorities. So the vice chair, myself on NBCA, Councillor Moffitt, uh, who else with you on uh, Rideau Valley as a councillor? Ian, Councillor Moffitt and I. Okay. And also South Nation, we have Councillor Kitts, Councillor Derouz, and Councillor Lula. And so you can see our participation and our interest in this uh, in this item. So I'm going to turn it to uh, uh, to Garrett, our legal service, to, uh, to to lead us in the presentation. Turn it Thank to you, you, Garrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Desjardins, are you able to pull up the... Um... Perfect. I see it's coming up. Great. So um, as, as you said, Mr. Chair, the um, this presentation concerns Bill 229 and just the aspects related to the Conservation Authorities Act contained in that bill. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the Bill 229 contains 99 um, amendments, 99 different statutes. So like I said, we're just focusing on Conservation Authorities Act for the purposes of this presentation. Um, this is summarizing a fairly detailed amendment. So um, all the details are contained in our staff report, which is listed on the screen and uh, is linked to in this presentation, which I can distribute after uh, the presentation. Um, the the bill is take, uh, putting into force amendments which um, started in 2017 were amended under the current government in 2019 um, and are further amended this year in bill 2229 so there's a lot of legislative history here and um, it's a fairly uh, several fairly detailed amendments to the conservation authorities act which collectively add up to quite significant amendments uh, next slide please the, um, I've, I've summarized the types of changes here just for ease of reference. Um, I would categorize them as five major types. First, there are changes to who may sit on the conservation authority boards and the length of their term. Secondly, there are changes to the types of services authorities are required or permitted to provide um, with new mandatory services and additional requirements for public disclosure um, for agreements with municipalities. Thirdly, there's uh, more provincial power to regulate authorities' budgets, though the specifics of those um, powers or the regulations that will be enacted under those powers are not yet known. Fourthly, um, there are restrictions on authorities' ability to appeal uh, Planning Act decisions and their ability to acquire land through expropriation. And finally, fifthly, um, changes to not yet proclaimed enforcement tools. Um, by removing the power to issue stop work orders. So we're going to drill down into these in a little bit more detail, but that's the overview of what's contained in this, this bill. Next slide, please. Um, the, the most significant changes immediately um, will be the changes to board composition. Um, as uh, the members of this committee are probably already aware from the report to council, municipalities um, uh, will be required to only appoint municipal councillors to conservation authority boards. This is a change from the current practice, which you're all aware of, that um, private uh, members are, are permitted to be appointed and, and in fact are in Ottawa. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just summarizing what our current boards are composed of. Um, and I, I might have missed Councillor Luloff. I, I think you mentioned, Mr. Chair, that South Nation was, um, Conservation Authority was Councillor's kids to Ruzin Luloff. But, um, in, in any event, we have uh, uh, at least 15 seats appointed by Ottawa members, um, by Ottawa, and we would need to fill those seats with uh, councillors, or alternatively, we'd have to amend our, our memorandum of understanding in each case with the other participating municipalities to um, permit 
a, a lesser number of, of members per municipality. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to those changes, there will also be changes um, which would allow the minister to appoint a representative of the agricultural sector to a conservation authority board. We don't have details yet about any other qualifications that might be required for this person um, or, or any other details about how that would be done or in which circumstances. The, additionally, the position of chair and vice chair is proposed to be limited to a one-year term. Um, additionally, a member will not be able to serve as chair or vice chair for more than two consecutive years. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the next group of changes relates to um, service provision by conservation authorities. Um, the current act provides a mechanism by which the minister can prescribe mandatory services that are required to be provided by the conservation authorities, but it doesn't include a list of those specific mandatory services. Bill 229 would specify a list um, while also allowing the minister to continue to add to that list by prescribing additional services. The list proposed um, is uh, are highlighted on this um, slide, but essentially it relates to three, um, three main service types, which are um, programs and services related to the risk of natural hazards, those related to conservation and management of lands controlled by the authority, and then um, programs related to source protection under the Clean Water Act. And then additionally, anything else that might be prescribed. Um, new slide, right, next slide, please. Um, Bill 229 also um, continues to permit authorities to provide programs and services um, pursuant to an agreement or memorandum of understanding between the Conservation Authority and the municipality. Um, the changes in Bill 229 require these um, agreements to be made public, which was a change that was previously proposed in the other not yet enforced legislation. Um, the minister is also given more power to enact regulations to limit the types of services that can be contained in these memoranda of understanding. We currently don't have a proposal from the ministry as to what types of limits they may choose to impose. Um, Additionally, Bill 229 retains the power for conservation authorities to enact uh, or to provide other services. Um, the language around this provision has been changed though, so that those services must further the objectives of the act. So um, it's unclear if that would limit the current uh, authority of the authorities to provide um, services other than those that are set out as mandatory services or those that are set out in an agreement with a municipality. Um, it, that would be something that might have to be considered in the future. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this slide relates to changes um, that have been made to conservation budget authority. Um, Bill 229 in brief essentially allows the minister to enact further legislation or uh, regulations with respect to budgets. Um, it essentially gives more control to the ministry over uh, aspects of conservation authority budgets. They would have to enact those through a regulation and that regulation has not been proposed. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the Bill 229 proposes as well to remove conservation authorities as a public body um, for the purposes of the Planning Act. Um, that has the effect that conservation authorities will no longer be able to appeal any um, Planning Act decisions, such as a zoning bylaw amendment or official plan amendment um, in a, that capacity as a public body. Um, conservation authorities would still be able to appeal um, decisions that are related to rezoning or other planning decisions of the land that they actually own. They're not appealing in a public body capacity. In that case, they're appealing as a landowner. Um, appeals from refusal of applications for a conservation authority um, permission for development under Section 28 would now go to the local planning appeal tribunal. Uh, previously, these were to be heard by the Mining and Lands Tribunal. Um, the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks would also be permitted to order a conservation authority to issue or not issue a Section 28 permit. And it, the minister may also issue a permit directly with or without conditions. And these would not be subject to a hearing or an appeal. 
Next slide, please. Um, the authority uh, was proposed to have a, a, a variety of new enforcement uh, mechanisms under previous legislation, which has not yet been proclaimed into force. Bill 229 um, would remove the proposed stop work order power uh, from conservation authorities. So again, this is not a power that conservation authorities currently have. It was a power that was proposed to be given to conservation authorities, which is now proposed to be taken away. <laughs> so um, that's the confusion there is due to all the conflicting um, amendments that have not been proclaimed into a force. Um, so this is a power that would have allowed conservation authorities to issue an order to stop um, actions which were contrary to um, a, the Conservation Authorities Act. Um, they do have other enforcement powers, such as the right to enter onto land without a warrant, search without a warrant, or issue an offense, uh, uh, or start an offense proceeding for contravening the act, issue an order for rehabilitation of land. So this is just one of those powers that's been removed. Additionally, um, conservation authorities had the power or currently have the power to expropriate land, which means taking land um, without permission, but with compensation to the former owner. Um, they would no longer have that authority under the um, Bill 229 proposed amendments. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this bill has not yet been enacted. Um, the first reading was on November 5th. Uh, it was referred to Standing Committee and is currently with Standing Committee. And um, we're expecting that Royal Assent, barring any major changes at Standing Committee um, or any other political changes um, would happen next week, December 7th through 11th. Um, once passed, the timeline for implementation of the Conservation Authority Act amendments has not been formally announced. Um, we're advised by conservation authorities that the province has indicated that the program changes would likely be implemented in 2022 budgets, which means we could expect to see uh, a requirement to renegotiate any agreements with municipalities um, in summer of 2021 if, if these changes go ahead next week as they're expected to. Um, next slide, please. Uh, as I, I alluded to before, um, Council approved comments to the Minister on November 25th. Uh, the City's letter focused on um, the impact of removing the private members from the Conservation Authority boards and urged the province to delay enactment of all of the amendments in order to permit further consultation with uh, conservation authorities and with municipalities. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I can have this uh, slide deck distributed to um, all the uh, co uh, committee members uh, after the presentation. This just contains some references for your further reading should you uh, like to refer to it. Um, I believe my colleague Amy McPherson is on the line as well to um, speak to um, additional staff comments on these changes. So subject to any questions, I'll, I'll pass the mic off to her. Sure, if I may, for one moment before we go to staff Certainly. questions, I, I just wanna do a quick recap that we rushed uh, the most urgent comments from the city to the province, which is on the board composition, which would basically have almost every member of council having to sit on the board of a conservation authority and it's entirely impractical in, in Ottawa's context. We did rush those out. The mayor did send that letter that has gone. Um, uh, you know, certainly we have concerns about the remainder of the legislation, uh, but we're being, I think, pretty practical about the fact that uh, we strongly believe that the province is on a, on a track to adopt the legislation as they have proposed, and we hope they will listen to the, the, the most urgent, tact, you know, very, very pointed question we ask them. So just want to put a practical lens on this. Um, it's, it's not that we didn't have other concerns, but we focused on the ones that had the, the most severe impact. Before we go to question, Steve, maybe you can, uh, <clears throat> out of the 34 or maybe 35 conservation authority we have in the province, uh, I think our city or maybe a handful of city will have a challenge sending uh, that many councillors to, uh, to the conservation authority where other small municipality, I don't think they will have similar challenge. Is that fair to say? 
The situation is quite different in different parts of the province. Not all of the province is covered by a conservation authority. Uh, that's first and foremost. And some conservation authorities cover a very, very large territory. If you look at like Lake Simcoe region, they have a lot of municipalities. And so their board is composed, but one from here, one from there, so it's no big issue. Ottawa is really unique in that we represent the majority of the three watersheds uh, in terms of land area. And so we have a very high representation in that situation. And if you take off the option for other other Conservation Authority board members, it, it forces councillors to do it. So we think the Ottawa situation is um, uh, different, but I would imagine even in the Toronto region, the Conservation Authority would have very much the same issue as finding enough uh, councillors to volunteer to want to do this. And, and, I, and I think many of the Conservation Authority boards have had some pretty strong people from the outside who really want to be part of this and, and who have actually made some significant contributions. So we hope the province will listen to us. And uh, as I said, as I said, it's uh, this this legislation is going fast, though. Okay, so uh, we'll go to my colleague if they have any question. I see uh, Councillor Kitts have her hands up. I hope I'm going in that order, Councillor Kitts. Just had a quick uh, clarification uh, comment. I believe that in regards to Councillor Luloff uh, being on South Nation, I believe that I replaced him um, when I was elected. I I think he was. Um, appointed when Councillor Blay vacated the seat and I replaced him. So I just wanted to share that. That's good. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, sorry, Councillor DeRuz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, I'm not going <clears> to, <throat> we saw the presentation and then uh, we uh, we kind of understood some of the changes that will impact uh, conservation authority, but I also uh, I also want to highlight I agree with you because uh, uh, the the budget of some of the conservation. If I look at South Nation, eighty percent of the budget that goes into South Nation is coming from the city of Ottawa, and is. Uh, we barely be able to have uh, two councillors to represent uh, to be on that table. Uh, if we don't have the other uh, public uh, member that they, we appoint, because uh, I mean, I, Councillor Kit uh, sits on CPS and it interfered with her committee. Uh, I I was in the same position uh, last term, and I know I am the chair of South Nation this year. So it's been it is very difficult to be able to make good decision for the taxpayer of the city of Ottawa on that table if we won't be able to allow to have uh, some public. Uh, uh, public presentation on that table. So I know I also have on our, uh, we have uh, our general manager from South Nation, Angela Coleman with us. She probably want to speak a little bit later if you allow her to just highlight a little bit what it's really the impact. Uh, and because she also worked with Conservation Authority Ontario, not only the local one with, in conjunction with Mississippi and of course with Rideau. So I will. Uh, I want to thank her for being here this morning, and I'm thanking you, Mr. Chair, for bringing this, uh, this issue forward and addressing on the motion to the minister to address these uh, these problems in the city of Ottawa. Because, like you said, it's very unique, and it's uh, we 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 have a lot of representation on the three uh, CAs that we represent in the city of Ottawa. Okay. Well, before we go to Angela, there's a question from uh, Councillor Gower, Mr. Vice Chair. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. It's uh, not a question, but a comment. I, I do want to thank uh, Garrett and uh, Steve and the rest of the staff for putting this together. Um, I, I sit on the board of the Mississippi Valley Conservation Authority. I'm serving as vice chair right now. So like Councillor DeRuz and, and uh, Councillor El Shantiri, you, you all know how uh, demanding these boards are. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty right now and with all of the changes happening from the province. To me, it's, it's actually not unlike what we've seen with um, some of the changes that the province is making to the healthcare system. These conservation authorities are uh, responsible for managing things like uh, water quality and flooding infrastructure, flood infrastructure. And um, I think the last thing we wanna see is, is less of an ability to have proper oversight and advice from, from yes, elected officials, but also the citizen members. Um, the time demand is is one thing that's concerning for me in terms of the changes, proposed changes to membership, but um, taking away that level of expertise that the public members bring would be um, would be a real detriment to the ability of these conservation authorities to function properly. Uh, so I want to thank staff for their contributions and uh, um, just state on the record how important these uh, groups are 
uh, overall to uh, to the health and safety of residents. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Vice Chair. It's well said, quite honestly, for a, I remember the first year I was appointed to the Conservation Authority in 2003, and the first meeting I attended, and the chair of the time said to me, oh, we have a tendency from Ottawa now 100%. I said, why is that? He said, well, you've been here first meeting. We never saw your predecessor before. So uh, just being uh, you know, appointed there, is, is, it is important to us. And we saw the value conservation authority bring to us, especially uh, someone like myself who've been through uh, two major floods in my community. And also we go through, uh, you know, the floods other than just those major floods. So uh, uh, they do a great job in our community. And and I, I want to touch something Steve mentioned. There's a member of the community or, or community members who are really passionate about being on the Conservation Authority. They have the experience, they have the environmental background, they have some uh, water engineer like the the, the, the woman who chaired Mississippi Valley Conservation, she, she's an environmental engineer by, by trade and she volunteered her time to be there. So uh, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, obviously the politics is, is a different game, but we did what we can as a municipality. We, we, we submit our letter through, uh, through our general manager on uh, November 25th. And I hope uh, other, I'm sure other municipality, they did the same. Uh, maybe we can hear from Angela because I believe Angela, she worked with uh, also others on her job, South Nation Executive Director. She also worked with the Ontario Conservation Authority. So she might want to tell us about how her colleagues across the province are handling this situation. Angela. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Angela Coleman. I'm the General Manager, uh, Secretary Treasurer of South Nation Conservation Authority. Um, as members have mentioned, we've enjoyed the um, really excellent working relationship with the City of Ottawa, and that's been hugely important for a number of environmental, ecological, um, as well as uh, benefits for the, the community at large. I think the staff did an excellent job covering uh, the points in the presentation. I think Garrett's presentation is very similar to the presentation I've given out there. Um, the, as you know, this matter was referred to standing committee, standing committee at the provincial level, and that ended on uh, yesterday, actually. So the deadline for submissions was yesterday as well. I know that Conservation Ontario did a very thorough presentation, uh, and we were very fortunate to have received very positive submissions and support that uh, are similar to the concerns that have been identified um, at, uh, at many municipal levels. So as you know, and as received with this presentation, AMO provided a very good summary. So the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, um, the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, I'm mindful that we are at ARAC and Ontario Federation of Agriculture uh, came out with an excellent piece on this, uh, as did the um, the uh, Provincial Planners Association, the OPPI, as and just a number of resolutions, as well as one from the, the big city mayors. Um, the thrust of what people are asking for, if something less than full revocation of this Schedule 6 of the, the budget schedule, is simply that uh, if it's not revoked entirely, that a number of key comments and, and consideration be considered on the move forward basis. And, uh, you know, the crux of those are three things we talked about, but what they lead into is what we hope will not be the potential for delays as we wait for and hear uh, different types of interventions from the province. So we're hoping to not have those types of delays in a time where, as you know, development approvals and so forth are very, very busy in all watersheds that cover the city of Ottawa. Uh, we want to know that the municipality's concerns are heard um, and that there's not unintended consequences really of what's being proposed in this bill. And we, we think that there's some of the partner organizations as well as the city have highlighted some good, potentially unintended consequences. And then of course, there remains a bucket category of public safety concerns. Uh, we all know that the Ottawa River and on our watershed, the St. Lawrence River as well, we are experiencing unprecedented flows and that's true across the Great Lakes as well. And we really need to know that um, the decisions that affect public safety uh, and property are made in a way that 
that are going to be protective of, of the citizens and the as well as the economic interests of our towns and cities across uh, the province. So I, uh, I really do want to thank the opportunity to attend at ARAC and I'm happy to answer your, any other specific questions and I can also um, provide a quick uh, verification that yes in fact Councillor Luloff was replaced by Councillor Kitts when she was able to join us. So uh, thank you for that and thank you for again the opportunity as well as the work of staff at the city to make all of these presentations come together in, in a quick and, and efficient manner. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Angela. And uh, thank you for your involvement as well. Uh, uh, any question from my colleague to, uh, to Ms. Coleman? See none. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Angela, for attending uh, our meeting today. And uh, on the item, uh, uh, we just need to receive that. Is that correct, Mark, uh, the presentation? Correct, Chair. All right, so can we receive the item? Received, received. Thank you. So we do have uh, additional item. Uh, I need your support to waive the rule because of timely is uh, the motion is uh, by Councillor Moffitt and that's the designation of a property on 6776 Rothborn Road. But before I turn it over to Councillor Moffitt, be it resolved that the following item be added to the agenda of December 3rd, 2020 meeting of Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee pursuant to procedural bylaw subsection 89.3 as a matter needed to be considered by the council in a timely manner and there is only uh, one more council meeting in 2020. So can uh, we waive the rule procedure to receive this item? I see yes from, uh, okay, so I'll turn it to Councillor Moffitt. Councillor Moffitt. Uh, thank you very much. Um, members of the committee might remember a, an item that we dealt with not long ago on the Goulburn Wetland Complex. Um, and through that, we made some changes to what the report was recommending. And as a result, there was a property that got caught in that that was in the middle of a, a site plan, a site plan control application. Um, so we would have addressed an issue uh, through that approval, which would be a deletion of a, of a wetland boundary. Um, so that didn't happen. So now we just have a, this kind of got caught in and this, this motion helps to address that and allows the development to proceed. Uh, so I'll just read it out. So whereas the province of Ontario has approved, wetland, has approved changes to the boundary of the provincial significant Goulburn wetland, Goulburn wetland complex, on the property at 6776 Rothburn Road, and whereas the area is designated as significant wetland at 6776 Rothburn Road on official plan schedule A are no longer consistent with the boundaries of the provincial, provincially significant wetland. And whereas the draft official plan released November 20th, 2020 seeks to make the significant wetland designation consistent with the boundaries of the provincially significant wetland complex. Whereas the owner of 6776 Rothburn Road, the city, the Mississippi Valley Conservation Authority mapped and agreed upon the new wetland boundary on the property with the city and the MVCA agreeing to consider a crossing of the wetland at a point where the wetland narrowed to the width of the Hazeldean Municipal Drain. And whereas the new wetland boundary with the proposed crossing would increase the developable area of the property and therefore be it resolved that the Agricultural Rural Affairs Committee recommend that council supports the redesignation by the local planning, by the local planning appeal tribunal, LPAT, of those areas of property at 6776 Rothburn Road, no longer identified by the province's provincially significant wetland from significant wetland to general rural area, as well as the proposed crossing and two, the rezoning by the LPAT of those property, of those areas of the property at 6776 Rothburn Road, no longer identified by the province as provincially significant wetland as RG1, as well as the proposed crossing. Thank you, Councillor Moffitt. And uh, any question on the motion from Councillor Moffitt? Well, can we carry the motion? Motion carried. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Moffitt, for bringing this up to us. So uh, we have uh, no in camera items, inquiries. I see none. Uh, other business? None. So, uh, our next meeting is going to be uh, February 4th, 2021. Before we adjourn, I would like to wish you, our staff, the, the residents who's listening to us, and to you and your family, a uh, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to all of you. And uh, 
uh, hopefully, I know 2020 was a rough year on all of us. So hopefully 2021 will be a brighter year to all of you and your family. So uh, with that uh, adjournment, so we're adjourned and have a great holiday folks. And uh, obviously we'll see you tomorrow in another meeting. Take care. Thank you. Did we miss anything, Mark, or everything? And we got everything. Thank you. I should have asked you that before we adjourned. But That's all right. <laughs>